welcome everybody. This is our first ever digital like a lounge. We're pretty excited about it. So I'm just going to read a couple of things if that's okay. So my name is Ashley McKibben. I don't know. I guess a lot of you guys have not met us. So this is brand new for us. Usually these are local events that take place in the store and we usually are serving beer and wine and all the fun stuff. But this time we come to you from your living room. Um, so we have some upcoming events pretty soon. Uh, this Saturday, we actually have a red dot camera talk, which you guys are probably pretty familiar with by now. Um, this Is it green?
Yeah, you're good. If I put it down to the pen, now it should be good. Okay, everybody can hear us. All right, sorry about that, guys. Everyone can hear, right? Give us a thumbs up. Yay, all right, <laughs> perfect. All righty, so I don't know where we left off, so I'm just gonna kind of start over. My name is Ashlyn, and I work here at Like a Store Miami. And usually we're doing this here with a live audience and hanging out together with some beer and wine, but we're just gonna hang out in each other's living rooms tonight. So I just wanted to run through a couple of the events that we have coming up. We have the Red Dot Camera Talk, live on YouTube, which is going to be Saturday, August 15th. So it's going to be at 8 o'clock. And this week's topic is going to be buying and selling used Leica equipment. We also have an online portrait workshop with Obar Cruz coming up August 28th through the 30th. And we're actually going to have that workshop in English and Spanish, which is really exciting and the first time we've ever done that. So the Spanish workshop is going to be September 4th through the 6th. So tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce photographic conceptual art artist Nicosi Gomez. He was born on the West Indian island of St. Lucia, but lives and works here in Miami. And this, um, over the last five years, he has actually self-published five photographic books, which he's going to show you tonight, I believe. Yeah. And then... Um, Let's see, what else do we have here? His work mostly deals with the suburban and industrial environments as a stage. He manipulates negative space, form, line, and the human figure to create a minimalist visual dialogue. So with no further ado, we're gonna get started here with Nikosi. And there you go. On, yeah. Sick. And you know, technology is supposed to make it, our life so easier. I keep telling people that. But you know what? It's okay. We figured it out. Hey, everybody, what's going on? We have a lot of professors in the group today, so I just want to make sure I tell those, uh, you know, people in society hi first. I respect what you do for our students. Um, I know that there are some professors from FIU and um, some other professors I had, uh, Mr. O and Tony Chirinos, if you're there. Thanks for joining. So, yeah, man, um, my name is Chance Gomez. It's a little difficult to look at the, the camera because it's a little bit higher and I'm actually looking at this screen. So if I look down, it's not that I'm trying to avoid eye contact at all. It's just the setup here is very profound. <laughs> but yeah, anyways, guys, welcome. Um, right now, I'm going to give an overview of my work. But before we get to that, I will give you a brief history on you know my becoming and how I got uh, involved in the photographic arts. Uh, let's see, let's see. Let's go to Acrobat. Bear with me here. It's getting my bearings. This is a Microsoft computer and I am a Mac kind of guy. All right. So you want a screen share as well? Yeah, screen share. Yeah, no problem. One second. All right, cool. All right. Screen share. All right, cool. Boom. Feel free to, you know, say hi in the chat too. All right, guys. Um, this is really cool because you guys are not all here with me. It takes the pressure off a whole lot. We have about almost 100 people in the chat, so that's really good. Awesome. So, full screen. Wonderful. All right, yeah. So, I'm going to go through my presentation now. And whoever is signing in, don't worry, you'll catch up. So my name is Nikosi. Nikosi means chief or king in the Zulu tribe of South Africa. My dad gave me that middle name. Uh, my first name is Chance, as in take a chance, but I just go by Nikosi because I don't know, I feel like uh, when people call me Chance, it reminds me of my past versions. I don't know, you know, the, the, the less enlightened ones. So I refer to myself by my middle name, all right? All right, to start off, I just want to say that I am an immigrant from the West Indian island of St. Lucia. And I really do appreciate this this uh, this land that I'm from. It uh, it they, it provides a lot of opportunity, you know. Um, I really am grateful for being here, uh, especially being an immigrant. Uh, you know, um, my mom she grew up on a rock, and 
basically, she came here to provide, uh, you know, more, how do you say, opportunities for us to, to kind of find ourselves in society. So I guess the land of the USA would be uh, the correct, the correct way to say it. Yeah. All right, cool. Hold on one second, guys. Just bear with me. I'm trying to get back to the, this is Acrobat. All right, cool. Hold on one second. All right, cool. We're back. It was going through autoplay. My bad. All right. All right, cool. So yeah, this is um, some film shots that I took from back home. And uh, if it goes on, sorry, sorry, guys. Let me just get this right. It's going on autoplay. Oh, man. Yeah, don't worry. Don't worry. Figure it out. Bear with me, folks. More paid transitions and auto flip off. Man, what was that distracting or what? I was going on and on for a second. My God. All right, here we go. So yeah, I'm gonna show you some shots from back home just so you can get an idea and visual representation of where I'm from. When I really started off um, photography, my mom, she uh, she really believed in, in you know, uh, starting me off with not like an intro level camera, but a professional body camera. So my first camera was a Nikon D800 and it was full frame. And when I started uh, fo um, photographing, I really got into HDR um, composites. So, you know, I was really into layering my photos and, you know, really editing uh, for textures and, you know, getting the most tonality out of my photos. So I really started doing a lot of landscapes. Just messing around, I had to be a teenager at the time. Um, my first photography class was in Robert Morgan Educational Center. Uh, I had uh, a, a professor named Dr. Marsh, and he was really cool. He basically started me off with the fundamentals of uh, the photographic world. That's my mom there. Had to include a picture of her. <laughs> And that's, I came to the United States in 1999. That's me and my sister. <laughs> All right, here we are. Let's really get started here. My photographic journey. So, you know, I, couldn't, I can't talk about my journey without talking about this person in my life. Uh, this is my dad. He is a travel uh, and it's kind of like photojournalist photographer. He manages a site called OceanTrader.co. This is the web page here if you guys are interested in seeing it, but he's into a lot of photo journaling. And I grew up basically being around him, being exposed to photography. He was, he made that really important and uh, he always factored in a picture moment. So that influence was always there. Um, you know, when you're, when you're beginning photography, you kind of try to find your bearings and uh, find where you fit into the phot photographic world as in like, where do your eyes gravitate to? And I feel like for a long time, maybe over five years, I was trying to find that and I would only shoot black and white digital phot photographs. So I will show you my black and white journey to begin with and then we could go forward into the color realm. So I'll kind of go through the shots and what was going through my mind at the time. It took a couple of days to ar get through the archives and pull these files out. So I, I have never published any of these shots. So this is very, much of an honor to show you these, where I started. So um, I wanna talk about these photos here. These are some portraits I would take of my friends. Uh, there's nobody else to shoot at that time when you're a teenager, you know? And uh, you know, it, 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 was, uh, it, was really, it was really just like, okay, here's my subject, you know? How do I make it interesting? And I would shoot these photos. I would take these pictures, just hanging out with friends. These are some still shots from St. Lucia in black and white. I think at that time, um, I was really attracted to very remote looking things, scenes, aesthetics. Um, and I like dated things, things that looked worn and rural. And that's where my eyes gravitated to when I was traveling or, you know, just finding things to photograph. All black and white. I, I really didn't believe in color at all at that time. I, 
I thought it was very distracting. And I, I would travel often. Um, I would go on a bunch of trips. Uh, this shot was taken in South Africa, in Johannesburg. Um, and it, you know, it, uh, the black and white realm really helped me understand uh, the stage of a photograph, how important that was. You know, what, what is a photo trying to say at the time? Although I think it was more subconscious for me. You know, I didn't, it's nothing that was apparent in my mind. You know, I would see a scene, photograph it, and uh, I would like the photo. Something about it seemed successful to me. Um, as I got here, I, I started to really uh, factor in negative space, especially the photo on the right with the shoe. I like how, you know, when you're photographing, there could be numerous focal points or just one. And I, I feel like it's here where I always, you know, made sure there was at least one focal point of interest, you know. Some more South African photography. This was uh, in 2013. So I've been photographing for over 10 years. So I think about seven of those years I've been taking it professionally. And I, I began photographing in school in my sophomore year of high school. Man, our professors look really serious in the chat here. How you doing, David Barry? Everybody okay? Carlos, Mr. Carlos, how are you doing? Good, good. Lou, Mr. Lou, and Mr. Gary. I see you guys. Just wanted to make that clear. Oh, my klutzness is coming out now. Forgive me. This is the Leica store. I don't want to break anything here. <laughs> All right, let's continue. So yeah, you know, like I said, I was attracted to very rural and dated looking photography. Um, you know, I, I, and at the time, you know, I, I thought photographing nude, the nude um, subject was really something I could get into. And, you know, I, I don't know, it's, it's not that I wanted to do it, uh, you know, uh, because that was my interest. I just felt like that was the path to follow if I was gonna go into this medium, you know, professionally. So I would ask my friends to model for me and they would. Um, a lot of the time when it came to nude photography at that time, I would uh, basically put silver metallic paint to get texture out of the skin and the body. So I would paint my subjects and then photograph them in just natural light, as you would say, quote unquote, natural light, meaning if I'm in a room, at least there's a one source of lighting coming in from the outside, one window at least. Move my mouse, no problem. It's right over the pictures. Okay, cool. Yeah, all right. Another thing that was r really popular in my interest is dreadlocks. Um, at the time, I, there's something about growing a crown, you know, and, and letting your hair fall from gravity and not, you know, taming it at all that really interested me at the time. And that time I didn't have any dreadlocks, you know, but I, I was very interested in photographing people with them. So I really focused on photographing portraits of people with locks, people with dreads. It's, it's such a symbolic symbol of freedom, you know, liberation, um, rebellion against the European standard, you know, standards of the world, you know. So that was very interesting to me at the time. Here are some more photos. This is actually from a long ongoing series called Dreads. Hopefully one day I get to finish it. The photograph on the left is probably one of my favorite shots I've ever taken. Um, this is of my friend Joel. And um, I went to school with him. I, you know, it, it, there's something about a photograph that could, it, it could make you feel a sense of, um, I don't know, nostalgia. And I was always, I'm always attracted to that. It's, I, I feel like photography is the closest thing to immortality. 
for anybody, for the subject, for the photographer. You know, the sensibility. All right, so moving forward, we've got past the black and white. I hope everybody's enjoying the foot, um, photography so far. Um, I hope I don't seem too nervous. I got Ashlyn and my girlfriend here with me, keeping me company. They're looking at me like, yo, just keep doing your thing. <laughs> yeah. All right, so how do I see? Uh, the best way for me to describe how I see is, is that most of, a, of what I see is unseen. It's, it's similar to how, um, you know, a barber cuts hair or a sculptor chips away at a piece of stone or, um, you know, tears away a piece of clay. So I, I could see a photograph before I make an exposure. And that, that's the base, best answer I could give you, best of the worst. But similar to this. So, you know, this is a picture I took a while ago. Completely oversaturated. This had to be around 2014 or 15. I really went from black and white to really trying to accept color so much that I would really overdo it. This is the second version of that photo. So this is kind of what I mean. And uh, I started getting into Photoshop, Lightroom, a different post-processing software, and I, I felt the need to manipulate the, the photo physically, you know. What can I add to the photo to spike some interest besides the subject and, you know, the background, the clouds. So I'd mess around with layers. And um, I think the number one um, functionality of Photoshop for me is the masking technique. I appreciate masking. I feel like if you understand how to mask in Photoshop, you pretty much can do whatever you want to do within a photograph take out detail and information or put in information and detail. So I started messing around with layers, exposures. This particular shoot, I asked my subject, it was two subjects and I asked them to walk around in really unorthodox ways. At that time I was uh, making continuous exposures and seeing what I could capture. And then I spent an hour or two on Photoshop, just masking them in, just to see if I could make an interesting photograph. I wouldn't publish this, by the way, though. But you know, at the time, it really interested me. <laughs> Trial and error. There's another one from that same suit, same subjects. See how I could, you know, manipulate them. So you know, there's there's a couple photographers that I really admire, and I won't, you know, uh, I won't start off with like Diane Arbus or. Cartier Brousson, like those photographers did a lot for the photo photographic realm. But the generation that I am in, I cannot say that I lean on them for in, in, um, inspiration. My inspiration comes from uh, artists of this age and a more European artists. Um, if I could name a few, uh, Ben Zank, he's incredible. I'll show you some of his work before we finalize. Uh, Brooke Dindanato and uh, Kyle Thompson, those are current day conceptual photographers. And around 2015, I, I really started to study their work. I loved how, you know, they would make their photographs seem like their subjects existed in a very eerie, um, remote setting. And I tried to emulate that as much as possible. This is another photograph where I would play with layers see what I could peel away, take away, make the frame look interesting. So yeah, man, I wish I could hear you guys. I feel like I wouldn't be able to talk to myself. I feel like I'm talking to myself, but that's okay. I hope that you guys are enjoying it. And if you have a question, you could ask in the group chat. Yeah, I'm on the group chat here. Yeah, yeah Ashlyn is managing the group chat right now. <laughs> You can pull it up on your yeah. if you want. All right, cool. So yeah, I'll talk to you about this shot a little bit here too. So um, one thing I tried to go for, and for, I guess from this time in my life, this was around like 2015, I really wanted to capture a narrative. I think that was most important to me at the time. And whether the narrative is something you understand or don't was my mission. And it's... It never had to be like, okay, you could identify what was happening in the photo right away, you understood the story, but at least create something that makes you, or spikes thought 
you know. This is one of my favorite shots here too. This is this is from my first project, my first book. Uh, it's called Follow Me, I'll Be Right Behind You. I wanted to create a publication that summed up the, mo the first four or five years of my photographic journey. And uh, you could find that on my site. And there are a couple images from here, I'll show you from there. And I feel like it's very important that I let uh, you guys see these set of photos because none of them are published on my site. This is this is all where I began. This, you know, if you don't know me at all, you can at least see where I came from to know where I am now and where I'm going. But uh, I've tried to experiment with my photography as much as possible. You know, another thing I want to add is just. Uh, a big part of, of why I shoot the way I shoot is to basically um, understand uh, what the unknown a little bit better. Why am I attracted to certain things, certain people? Um, why is the subject doing certain things? How does the subject relate to their environment? The subject is uh, an artist in Miami, a local artist. His name is Joel Gaitan. He's a wonderful person. I started working with very eccentric people, and uh, I wanted I wanted to to make my photographs a little bit more abstract, a little bit more enig, um, um, you know, more of an enigma. So I, I the first thing I changed was who I was shooting. I find that in Miami, you know, people and artists of the same we work with the same crowd like we work with the same crowd of creatives and uh, we work based on following and uh, platform status you know uh, power of agency and we don't work with just creatives because we find something unique in them and with this particular individual i found something unique about him he's a painter and something about his look something about his vibe i just wanted to put my lens on him and so this was the first shoot i did with him you guys got to check out his work. He's from Nicaragua. Very cool guy. Man, Russell, you look pretty comfortable there. I wish I could join you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> so here, um, here are a couple more shots, really getting into color. And before, the, the, when I got into color, I would really oversaturate my work. And I guess when I got to about here, this is around like 2016, I started to desaturate my photos. So the colors were a lot more cooler, uh, a lot less tonality, a lot less vibrance, you know? And they're still relatively bright though, you know? Oh yes. And another, another very important thing to me here is, is lens choice. I shoot all wide. I, I started off with a 14 millimeter Nikon 2.8. No, no, it was a 1.4G. So you, if you know Nikon, you know what lens I'm talking about. It's a big lens. And uh, I loved how the wide angle distorted the subject to a certain extent. It would distort what you were seeing. You know, at the edge of the frame would barrel. The, the middle of the frame would become very wide, you know? I love getting up close to my subjects and photographing them really close, really distorting the proportions, especially with males, because there's, uh, I don't know, the males have you know, more contouring in their face, more lines, so you could get more distortion out of it. This guy's name is Andre Valentino. He's a good friend, and uh, my photography really has grown with him. We shot together for um, like going on maybe three or four years straight. So I have a lot of photographs of him. He's a cool Miami artist, musician. Just visual direction is crazy. And this is like leading up to 2016, 2017. Now you can see just how much I desaturated my photos going from extremely colorful to like really low vibrance, just subtle colors, very pastelish. Color is a big deal for me. You know, I, I feel as if color, um, it makes you feel things, you know? And when there's too much of it, it's like the mind races. It, it's super excited. 
and uh, you know it's it's hard to kind of digest things with too much color. At the same time, things are really pleasing when the right colors are in it. You know, uh, throughout high school, I had four art teachers for every year. So I had a freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior year, all different teachers. Professor Obergon, if he's in the chat, he told me he would come. I think I had him for junior year, and uh, he taught me a lot about color composition. Um, he never would let us use black oil paint. He told us we could use our own paint, you know, to make black. And I, I understood that very well. So I feel like my understanding of color from visual art, you know, drawing still lives or painting really maneuvered itself way through the medium of photography. Here's some more tones, I would sample tones. These are some nice, beautiful pastelish tones. So yeah, we got any questions in the chat so far? Um, no. No, everybody's pretty quiet. How's everybody doing? Good? Is... Professor Carlos is good. He's with me all the way. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> so, um, and that, you know, it's, it's nice photographing people, but it's also nice photographing things, you know? I feel like no matter what I put my attention on, if it gets my attention, it's, it's um, how do you say it? It's worth photographing it. Even if it's the most banal street corner. If, if I could look at it, if it pulls my attention in any way, I'll photograph it. Um, I took a trip in 2017. I went to uh, London and then I traveled to France and I saw some amazing architecture and something about the way line and form, texture and color all work together. You know, the elements of design really fascinated me. So I started really incorporating, this is a shoot I did in London with a friend. I like how we could arrange the body and, and manipulate it to, to be very straight and obscure or structured, you know? I was really testing the boundaries of, of my photography at the time. Here's some more shots. So I wrote down some stuff here so I wouldn't get too sidetracked because I, I do tend to go on a lot. Um, so, you know, what, what makes a, a successful or striking image to me? Um, like I mentioned before, is the ability to push boundaries and understand your software as well as your tools um, and also your lens choice. Um, I feel like with the lens choice and your software and how your subject relates to your environment all play a role, especially your lens choice. So I feel like the, the subject is the noun and the lens choice is the adjective. The lens choice describes the noun, you know? So I feel like if I took these pictures with a 15 millimeter lens, they wouldn't have come out the same as if shot with a 12 millimeter or 12, uh, 14 millimeter lens. I feel like once you go wide, you never return, man. All right, guys, I'm gonna really start getting into my current work. But before I start talking about my current work, I gotta talk about this guy. This is Professor Tony Chirinos. I know some, yeah, Mr. Carlos knows him. You, I mean, you gotta know this guy sometime in life, man. He stands like at a whopping five foot two. He definitely makes himself heard and presents itself at the highest degree. Um, this is like a very influential character in my photographic career. Um, Professor Chirinos definitely helped me understand how to create a stage in my photograph, as well as uh, stripping me from my photographic ego. Uh, I think the first class I took from him, he definitely saw talent in me, but uh, he definitely he definitely knocked me off like uh, my comfort zone. Uh, sometimes I would be way too attached to certain photographs and he would definitely let me know how it is, how he really felt about it, you know, whether he thought it was successful or not. My mouse, my bad. I keep forgetting that mouse. So, you know, if he's here in the chat, much love to Professor Sharinos. Uh, the photographs that I'm going to show you now, he definitely had a huge influence in them. And um, before I get to that, this is his website, Tony Sharinos. 
uh, dot com. You can go and check out some of the series. He has a wonderful project on Cox um, it, and also eliminating immigrants. I really like that one as well. And this is the only photographer that I know that photographs the dead. You know, he photographed um, subjects in the morgue for a long time. They're extremely beautiful shots. And this guy is definitely the, uh, how do you say, it? the Lord and Savior of the dark room. He taught me original film photography, black and white, how to develop black and white. And I really appreciate that. All right, let's see. How do I go to my website, Miss Ashlyn? One second, guys, bear with me here. You're still on full screen here. So. Yeah, definitely. Hold on a second, guys. I'm going to go to my website. If you want to go to my website, it's Chance. Uh, no, sorry, Chance Nicosi Gomez. That's N K O S I G O M E Z dot com. And you could follow me. I'm going to go through some of my series. Man, it's already 45 minutes. How long have I been talking? <laughs> I've never had to talk this much, so forgive me. We did have some technical. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you want. Hey, enter right here. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Wonderful. You want to share it again? Yeah, we'll share it. So, yeah, if you guys can join me on my site, chancenicosigomez.com. Um, chance and you can full screen. All right. So, I want to start, let's see, we could start at Sonata. I feel like I need to start there. So, you know, I, I, I mentioned for a second that I, I like photographing banal and mundane scenes. Something about, you know, lifeless scenes intrigues me. I, I, I think it's because, like, my world is so hyper-stimulated, meaning I live in Miami, Florida. It's very flashy. Everything's very posh. And I can uh, appreciate the most remote places or, you know, rural scenes. Something about it intrigues my psyche. And... Um, like I said, I, I like things that people don't usually put their attention on. I like how the elements of design work together to achieve a very simple photograph. <laughs> Some critiques with Mr. Shirinos would go really rough because he didn't understand why I was photographing what I was photographing, but he definitely encouraged me to keep doing it. You know, I really respect professors like that because um, his work is entirely different in nature, but he could still guide you in producing something of your own. So these shots, most of them were taken here in Miami, some of them others, other locations in the world, uh, Europe, and definitely California, New York. And uh, usually uh, what I would do is I would take my camera out and I would just go on a walk. Um, a photographer, Minor White, he used to do that a lot. Um, Eggleston. Um, just go and photograph what you see, you know, what captures you. you know, I feel like, there, you know, it, it didn't matter what it was, like I said. I would take a picture of it if it was intriguing enough. There's something I wrote down here that I really want to express here, too, before I get sidetracked. Let's see. Man, okay. Yeah, composition. Composition is really big in this, this series here. Um... You know, I feel like um, composition doesn't only exist with, uh, you know, the visual art world. It also exists in life. I feel like the perfect amount of balance and tension, you, you, you experience a really nice reality. So it's the same with a photograph. So, you know, if the color is right, if the form is right, if the texture is right, you know, line, how, how all of that works together. I feel like, you know, that's a successful striking image, you know. So I try to keep that in mind with this series. This is series two, it's an ongoing series. And yeah, really factoring in just, just the ordinary. So check it out, we're gonna move to, uh, let's move to Bird Singing Lies. This is my series three. This series was done in 2018. I had a showcase for it December 14th. Uh, basically, this series was questioning the everyday normalities of life. Um, have a book here. I actually produced a book from it. This is Bird Singing Lies, the book. There are 13 concepts, and uh, each concept varies in its approach. 
Uh, I'll show you some of my favorite ones. We won't go over all of them. All right, one second, guys. Let's see. How do I move this? Okay, cool. Yep. All right, guys. This is one. This is a really favorite one. This one with the uh, the subject with the cigarettes in her her mouth. Um, it's basically questioning, you know, you know what the things we consider normal are actually speeding up our extinction. So I wrote, as we speed up our own extinction and exhaust resources from our Earth Mother, how much time do we have left? And uh, I titled this photograph "Eleven O'clock." So I, I use cigarettes as these you know, symbolism for the, um, our extinction, you know? You know, this one here too, concept six, recovering the inner child. I feel like we're molded into people without spirits by the time we're like 25. You know, we start, you know, engaging in these like adultish thoughts, you know? We, we embody these roles in a society that strip us away of, our creati creativity. There, there are silly uh, subconscious things that we do as children that, you know, are corrected over time. And I, I wanted to make images that uh, reflect those habits. This one too, concept eight, hair Reiki. I work with Solange. She's an artist here, a hairstylist and artist, hairstylist here in uh, Miami. And she made this ball of hair and uh, basically, I collaborated with her um, in efforts to produce an image that kind of accepts all different types of hair. We just wanted to create a very peaceful looking hairball. <laughs> and this is another favorite here. Time doesn't exist, clocks exist. Concept nine. We don't understand time in that we can't perceive it or observe it from any kind of inclusive perspective. So it's true nature always eludes us. I feel, like, I feel like I'm a pretty timely person, but I also feel pressed when I'm not on time and I felt the need to create a concept behind it. Times doesn't exist, clocks exist. This is by far one of my favorite series because it was shot within the same location and it, it really tested me on how I could manipulate whatever was in front of my camera and create an interesting image. And I, I use this minimal props. It was just a warehouse and we moved things into the frame, a table. We got little things, you know, to really bring forth the idea. I'm gonna move on to a series that I'm working on recently. It's called Only One in, On My Floor. If you guys wanna move on there with me. This series uh, was inspired from Sonata as well. I can't tell you how many times I'm walking or driving and I look at a certain building and I'm wondering who occupies a building or a house or a window. And I felt the need to create a series that basically, uh, you know, it, uh, how would you say, isolates a certain window and makes it the direction of the shot, it makes it the focal point of interest of the shot. And I would use, do this by post-processing Photoshop. And each, uh, each window has its own story. And you guys could read through that. There's about 12 windows so far that I'm working on. So this is an ongoing series I started last year and I'm having a lot of fun with it. I got about five minutes until the Q&A, right? I'm trying to expedite this. Okay, cool. All right, um, I also I wanna talk about this series here. This is a recent series I did last year and Professor Chirino's really helped me out with it as far as um, where, where I wanted to take it. I felt like when I was doing nude, nude um, photography in my premature years of starting, um, I wasn't taking it to a level that I could say something different with the body. So, I came up with this project to basically showcase the body in space and time in a, in a different way. And I was basically not uh, inspired by Edward Weston, Emojin Cunningham, and current day photographer, Chloe Rosser. Uh, a lot of these shots 
it was more so what could I do with the body and how could I make the body interesting in a very subtle environment. Most of these shots were composed at the subject's residence and I felt the need to, to really elude the view of the face for most of them. This was a very challenging series for me. I, uh, I got a lot of fight down for this series in, in uh, how do I put this in a nice way? It, from the artists that I was inspired by. And I, I feel like I could turn it into a educational uh, lesson. So, you know, my, my professors always encourage me, if you don't feel inspired enough, see who you can emulate. So, you know, that's the reason being I took Three, three photographers, two 20th century photographers and one current day photographer. And I see how they photograph the body and I tried to do something similar. Um, one of the photographers, a current day photographer, I'm assuming wasn't too happy with it. And I got a message one morning from a gallery in London saying that I was plagiarizing. So, you know, it was to my shock. It was, you know, I was like very taken back. You know, I was uh, reluctant to hear this because, you know, it's one thing if you set a pathway for other artists to follow, and it's another thing if you feel like they're taking away from something that you've built on your own. And I felt that she responded to these images in a way that she thought I was plagiarizing. So I wanna make it clear that she is definitely credited in my book, uh, Where Does the Body Begin? Which is a series they're looking at right now. This is her book, Chloe Rosser, Form and Function. You can find it online. She's a wonderful photographer. I have nothing but respect for her, her project, and uh, I got a lot from it, you know, as far as inspiration. It's unfortunate that it was taken that way. Um, I felt like it was a deformation of my character at the time that they were trying to go with, and uh, my professors were very reassuring that, you know, there are too many factors in the photographic world to implement to directly plagiarize, you know, vantage point, camera to, to subject uh, distance ratio, um, your, your aperture, your subject, where is it being shot? I felt like, you know, um, they felt challenged at the time and they were trying to make a big deal about it. Anyways, most of that has been put to rest already and, um, you know, I'm, I'm still promoting my series. I'm, I'm very proud of the, the project and um, I feel like if the photos weren't successful, I, I wouldn't have caught their attention to begin with. Um, the last series that I'm going to talk about here is, uh, let's see, actually, yeah, the one I'm working on now. Uh, right now I'm working with two twin ceramists of Aya Sham Creations. Um, these are beautiful twin sisters. And just like how Arbus photograph twins, I'm going in that direction, except uh, I'm implementing the modern world and how I see them relating to their environment. So this is an ongoing series I'm working with now. Their names are Maria and Maria, um, Maria Del Mar and Maria Jose. And you can find them uh, on internets. You can look them up. They are twin ceramists and they are extremely talented. I'm very attracted to who they are and uh, I just felt the need to make them my muse. So that's what I'm working on as of now. All right, I want to open up the chat to a Q&A because I do feel like I've talked a good amount and I haven't looked at the camera at all. So, okay. <laughs> so yeah, let's open it up. Let's see what questions we got here. You can pull the chat up, right? You see it? Yeah, let's see. I do have a couple questions that I've been writing down as people are going. So someone said, how important is clothing choice in your photos? Uh, I. It, it, is, it is relatively important. I feel as if uh, if the clothing has logos or some type of symbolic nature to it, I feel like it takes away from the photograph. So I, I do encourage the subjects to wear bold, bold colors or uh, clothing that doesn't take away from the actual direction of the shot. So I don't like shooting brands. I feel like we're walking brand already. We wear Nike shirts. They get free publicity from us after they already taken our money. So I feel like if I'm photographing a subject, I ask that they, they wear just something simple, bold, minimal patterns so we could really make something creative of its own and not just another flyer for some high-end brand that really doesn't care about us, you know? There we go. 
Yeah. Yeah. Someone said, which body of work that you've shown was your favorite out of all of them? Uh, my favorite body of work, it's probably, it probably has to be Odessa. It's uh, most of the work in this series, I'm, a lot of people recognize me by. It's basically subjects in a rural world. Um, a lot of the subjects, they don't show their face. Sometimes they do. And, you know, they're caught doing very obscure things. You know, they're very unorthodox. Their body language is like, just very strange. And I like photographing subjects this way. I think Ben Zank does a very good job at it. And I'm trying to create something of my own with it. I like how they're, they're hiding behind structures. Uh, they're facing towards walls, you know? I, I try to make the photos surreal as much as possible. Someone says, um, what tools do you use when there isn't enough light for a photo? Oh, when there isn't enough light for a photo. Man, that's one thing I didn't go over. Uh, well, before I answer that, my desired time of day to shoot would be in the morning, anywhere between 8 o'clock and 10.30. I feel like the light that you get at that time of the day is the most beautiful light on Earth. It's like, it's crystal, it's white and blue, and your colors are true to it, you know, to actually how you're seeing it, you know? Um, so if there's no light, what is my desired form of light? I don't use a lot of artificial light. I don't use a lot of studio light. So I do photograph on a tripod a lot of the time. So that means very slow exposures. Um, but mo most of the time, that's never a, tr uh, you know, a challenge. It's never a factor. Um, someone asked if you usually do your post-processing in Lightroom in regards to color grading. OK, OK. Um, Okay, that's another one. So generally when I'm shooting, I'm shooting in RAW. And um, in the, I shoot Fuji system. So I'm using a Fuji X-T2 right now. Um, I wish I was shooting a Leica. That would be nice. We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> but um, I'm shooting a Fuji system and there's a mode on the Fuji called RAW F and it basically lets you pick a preset. So my preset is usually Acros, which is a black and white preset but it still lets me develop a raw picture. And that way I could focus on shooting in color when I'm actually just seeing uh, black and white in the EVF. And when I upload the file into my, uh, my computer, my server, it actually comes out in color. And the reason I did that is because I, I, I realized that I worked so well shooting in black and white that I wanted to keep shooting in black and white, but editing in color. It, it kind of reduces the amount of anxiety I feel because like I said, colors can excite the mind. So, so yeah. I have somebody that says that they feel a sense of discovery and interactivity with your work and they want to know if that is intentional. Discovery and interactivity. I, I, I kind of, yeah, I kind of feel that, you know, but at the same time, I, I try not to, I try not to limit like how people feel about my work and correct them because I feel like, you know, however you perceive something, it, it, however it stands to you is, is it's true to you. You know, I don't, I don't want to mold that in any way. Some people feel a, a sense of loneliness. I've a, expressed like the, a sense of, of longing or just, you know, what's happening in, in my photo, photographs. And I don't, I don't want to at all get offended or anything like that. Yeah. Do you feel like they're super planned? I, uh, some of the, most of the shots, especially from the Odessa series, they're all structured. Um, yeah, a lot of the concepts are fixed and I do go scouting for locations and I figure out color tones as wardrobe goes and props and stuff like that, yeah. Um, for the Sonata series, none of that is, is planned out. Usually I come across those scenes on my everyday life, um, just photograph them. So I have someone who asked how your inspiration comes. So I know you mentioned a few people you're inspired by. Yeah. How else, I guess? Uh, my inspiration, um, where does it come from? There's so many sources. My, my inspiration comes from stillness, I feel. Uh, when, when things are calm and clear, when my dialogue is completely uh, tranquil, I feel like then I have enough room in my mind to figure out what interests me. Um, sometimes uh, events in my life trigger uh, certain directions I want to take in my photographic realm. 
I feel like with the Odessa series, I'm, I'm very much of a, a loner. I don't have a group of friends. And I feel like it's me emulating me, uh, how I would behave in the world if I was by myself. So that, that series, series uh, Odessa, is, I feel like that's me in every shot, but it's, it's just another subject that I'm replacing as myself. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Someone said, how do you decide when to use diagonal versus straight lines in your film? Man, this is something I go through with, with Tony Chirinos. Tony Chirinos, um, he, he's tried his best to try to get me to photograph more horizontal images. He says that uh, I photograph too many vertical images, and I agree with him. Y you know, if it's an implied vertical image, you know, your eyes either going up and down the photo or down and up. And sometimes that's not what's happening in the stage. I'm really trying my best to produce more horizontal images, and I'll get there at some point. But um, I think it's just a habit of, you know, photographing vertically. I, I, I see things that way. I, I like lines that go up and down and instead of horizontal from left to right. You've got several people saying it's cool to see the evolution. Yeah, I, I see Professor Carlos. He seems to be getting a kick out of every time I mention uh, Chirinos. He seems to know him pretty well. You know him, you know him. I, I, I've gotten through some tough critiques with Mr. Chirinos. I really do thank him, man. I really appreciate him. All right. Any other questions? Any other question, guys? This is the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, I really appreciate everybody for logging in. Um, like I said, I have photo, sh uh, photo books available here, and um, I'll show you some of them. So like I said, uh, this is Where Does the Body Begin? I don't know if you guys could see it uh, right here. Yeah. So this is the last book that I completed. It's an all uh, black and white nude photography book, which explores the body in space and time. Uh, this is a larger book here. This is Bird Singing Lies, and it's all concept photography, exploring the normalities of everyday life and truths. Let's see what other ones do I have here, excuse me. Oh, this is uh, Sonata. This is a very favorite book here too. And this is the street photography that I do, you know, the mundane battle scenes. This is a really nice one. I really appreciate this one. And then the last one I have here is a book called Rwanda. And I, I photographed in Rwanda, Africa last year. Um, it was really nice to be there. And you know, the genocide happened there around 1994. So it was, it was interesting to see how, how life progressed after. And I really like photographing the locals as well as kind of just checking out the scene. So I produced this book. It's all black and white photography. So I do have a couple questions here. Um, someone said, would you ever photograph a project during night? Nighttime. I, I, I'm getting there. Yeah, maybe some long exposures, maybe some, you know, if I involved some lights, that would be interesting. Yeah. I also have someone asking, how was the publishing experience? How long did it take and how did you choose which photos to put in? Wow. Yeah, the publishing experience. I, I, I really do give thanks for self-publishing because like, I, I feel like it's very much a challenge as a photographer to get your work published by anyone. And let's say somebody does publish your work and you don't sell out, then you have to end up paying off all that, all those books back to the publisher. So I feel like with self-publishing, you buy your own ISBN, you put out your own book, you design it the way you want to, and you know, you manage your sales by yourself. And it's the same way as selling prints. You know, this is new age. Um, it's, it's, it's expensive. I'd say that, you know, I, I, I publish with Blurb, B-L, no, yeah, B-L-U-R-B dot com. And they're the best to me. Uh, their quality is really good and their prices seem to be pretty fair. I also have a trick. I usually wait until Black Friday every year when they have really huge markoffs and I usually put out a book during that time. So when I do order in bulk, I basically make um, my profits off of the, the sales, like the percentage off instead of paying regular price sets. Because the, the books are, it, it's hard to make a profit off of photo, photographic books if you're self-publishing them. So... Yeah, I love these books, man, because, you know, it's, this is the hieroglyphics of photography besides prints, you know, a, a, a container of photographs. It's like a portfolio. And I feel like if you understand the true nature of photographic books, you support those who uh, put their time into making them. 
I have someone saying, where did you, where do you see yourself in five years? Five years? I would, I would like to see myself in five years somewhere in Colombia with my partner and I have a family and I'm photographing somewhere there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I want to move away from the United States and I want to live a much more simple life, uh, you know, and still photograph, you know, I, I've grew up here a long time and um, especially coming from the Caribbean, I wanted to return to that, that more solid grounding foundation. And I feel like moving to another country will help me bring out more of my undiscovered self, and much love to Professor Obergon. I see he's in the chat. He's just on mute. Much love to him. He's uh, definitely a great professor. All right. Any other questions? Any other questions, guys? Continue traveling, my man. I love that dream. Beautiful soul. What high school did I go to? I went to Robert Morgan Educational Center. That is on 186th. Yep. Thank you for your process and evolution. Much love, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys for making time to hear me out. I was very nervous, but it helped that you guys were far away. I know we had some technicalities at the beginning, but we did get over it. <laughs> I'm smiling a lot, man. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. I'm reading all the comments now. Ah, uh, you did awesome. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. I really do. You guys can keep up with my work on Instagram, um, N-K-O-S-I Art on Instagram, Nikosi Art. When are you planning to go to Europe? Yeah, I did have a plan to go to Europe, but the Corona persona came around and I'm, I'm not traveling anywhere for the time. You know, um, that, that uh, and then, you know, I, I don't know, my, my ideas kind of switched. Uh, I'm gonna finish up this, this uh, major uh, that I'm in right now, photographic technology and Travel the world. I'd like that very much. Awesome talk. Congrats. Keep it up. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, and all the work that you've seen, if you guys are interested in any prints, please email me with the picture that you, you uh, like, and we can negotiate. I would definitely love to send out some prints to some of our participants today. Send out some books. Let's uh, bargain. Let me get my work to you. Right on. Your email here well. Yeah, they're gonna link my email. Much love to Ashlyn for keeping this uh, first Leica lounge talk. I hope I set somewhat of a standard here for you. Yeah, you did great. All right, cool. You did a great job. <laughs> you should photograph Cuba once the coronavirus is over. I would love to. I see a lot of successful film photography coming out of Cuba. You know, I, I love I, I love photo books from Cuba. Yeah, it feels like that place hasn't been changed at all, you know? Yeah, that's a great idea, Genesis. Gary, thanks, keep shooting and stay safe. Much love, Mr. Gary, keep hope alive. <laughs> right on, yeah, guys. All right, we're gonna wrap up, is that cool? Yeah, definitely. All right, sorry for dropping your mic there a second, I'm highly klutz. Thank you everybody for joining. Thank you for joining, peeps, all right.